I think I'd find it quite useful if there's anyone on the call who has examples of these. So there might be one locally that we could go and visit. Cool. Be great to know. Fantastic. So with that in mind, perhaps it might be useful if people say where they're from in their name. So if you find your face on this wonderful Zoom screen, right click on it and it should say rename. And yes, if you can at least put where you're from, then at least people you know, can start to get a picture of who's where and, and so on and so forth. So if we can find some examples, you know, who we can, who's, who's nearby us. Uh, there we go. Fantastic. So let's begin. So first of all, what is a forest garden? Would someone like to try and give me a definition? What do you think a forest garden is? And remember, there's no such thing as right or wrong. I'm asking, what do you think it is? So whatever you say is correct. It's, um, it's a garden that, uh, it's, this is not an accurate description, um, but it, it replicates the, uh, a new forest forming, but with edible, medicinal and beneficial trees, shrubs, ground cover. Um, nice. It's sometimes de described as, as similar to a forest glade, but it isn't quite the same. So Very nice. Very nice. Anyone else like to offer something? Anita? Uh, it's a way of growing edible crops that works with natural processes and is in harmony with the seasons and is low maintenance and as good for people as it is for wildlife and biodiversity. Ooh. One question though, is it just edible crops? No, no. Ooh. Beneficial. <laughs> uh, uh, so it has permaculture principles of, um, yeah, bene so each of the plants uh, works in harmony with other plants. So it's do it, so yeah. <coughs> but it could be anything we grow in there. So uh, another way of maybe putting it, it could be a food forest, um, um, edible landscaping. There's lots of different ways that we could explain this, but effectively what a forest garden is, and it's a combination of all the beautiful stuff that uh, both James and Anita said, is it's where we create some kind of where we, we work with nature to create some kind of a landscape that is beneficial to animals, insects, and at the same time gives us some kind of useful yield, whether it's food stuff, could be um, soaps, it could be building material, it could be um, uh, material for uh, craft work, it could be for making dyes and art, it could be for medicine, it could be for so many different things. So maybe to get you into a kind of picture for this, maybe I'd like to walk you through just a little visualization for a few minutes. Um, so I'd like to invite you to just maybe close your eyes, put your pens and your mice and your keyboards or whatever it is down, sit nice and comfortably, maybe take a few deep breaths. Maybe close your eyes. And I'd like you to imagine it's the middle of summer one of the hottest days of summer. But you are in a forest. You're in a deep, dark, mature forest. It's the hottest day of the year. But what does it feel like in the middle of this forest? Perhaps you notice it's nice and cool. And you ask yourself why? What's going on in the middle of this forest? It's so hot out there in town. Why is it so nice and cool in the forest? 
you start looking around and you notice, you look up and you see the canopy. You see all the branches of all the trees trying to find their space, trying to find uh, the sun, trying to find, you know, and pretty much making a really beautiful cover. So the only light that's coming through is just this beautiful, soft, dappled light. So the intensity of the sun has been taken away by the sunlight, by the canopy of the trees. You start walking around and you start to look at what else you notice in this forest. Maybe you start noticing the soil or what's on the ground. So you decide to get on your hands and knees. Yeah, let's be like a little kid again. Let's get down there. Let's, what do we see down here? Maybe the first thing you notice are all the leaves, all the dead leaves. Maybe there's some branches. Maybe there's a few twigs and a few other things. And uh, you know, that's a beautiful sound as you kind of move it away and just make a little bit of a gap. And what you notice is underneath there. Maybe you see a few little insects scurrying around, running away as you're bearing, you know, moving the, the cover. But what do you notice about what's underneath here? Maybe you notice that it's the leaves that are being broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. And you dig a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and these pieces get smaller and smaller until it, you hit one point where it's almost impossible to tell the difference between the leaf, the twigs and just soil. It all looks the same. And you take one look at this, you put your hand in there, you take a handful out of this out and you notice it's beautifully soft and moist. It hasn't rained for almost two months. How come this is so nice and moist? And then you bring it up towards your nose and you smell this forest floor. Oh, wow, it smells good enough to eat. This is beautiful. It's like the most amazing, perfect compost. It just smells so wonderful. And you think, wow, this is the most amazing food growing soil I can imagine. There must be so much, so many things growing here. So you take a step back and you look up and you look around. Where's all the carrots? Where's all the tomatoes? I don't see any cucumbers. Where's the corn? Where's the wheat? How come, what's, how come nothing's growing in here? What's going on? Hmm. So you ponder this and you keep walking through the forest. And maybe you get to the edge of the forest and you look out and you notice there's a meadow. And maybe you conclude the reason why there isn't anything growing in the forest is because of the lack of sunlight. And then you see the meadow. You think, wow, loads of sunlight. There must be tons of things growing here. So you go out into the meadow and you look and you see all these amazing different colours of different flowers and all these really tough plants. And you think, wow, they there must be something edible here. And there's a few things, you know, maybe I can eat this flower, maybe I can eat that. But still, there's no carrots, there's no tomatoes, there's no... But this has all the sun. How come this aren't, things aren't growing here? So you notice underfoot, as you're walking, the, the ground was no longer nice and soft. So you, you take a... Okay, let's investigate this a bit. And you get down to the soil and you notice it's really tough. It's really hard. You don't get this beautiful smell. You don't get all this life that you had, this beautiful, soft, rich soil that was in the forest. Hmm. What's going on here? And then maybe think maybe there's too much sun. So you walk back because you want to get back into the shade and then you see the edge of the forest place where the forest meets the meadow and all of a sudden you notice oh wow look there's a wild plum there's a wild apple some dog rose and then you notice there's some nettles and some burdock and some wow and all of a sudden 
you notice there's so many things growing at this edge where the forest meets the meadow. And you ask yourself, why? What's going on here? And I'm going to invite you to come back, open your eyes, and maybe answer that question. What do you think is happening at that edge? So feel free to just unmute yourself and just uh, feedback. It balanced. There's like the balance. There's um. There, there isn't too much sun. Mm -hmm, exactly. And there, and there isn't too much water. And there's a there's a balance. It's got the nutrients from the the tree canopy and that's mm. gone into the soil. But it's, you got sunlight. First, most important point. It's get it, it, well. Several points. Perfect that you brought up there. First of all, it has this niche of. Some parts are sunny. You know, this edge of a forest isn't just straight. It's not a big straight line, boom, forest, now it's meadow. It's mixed. It's, you know, there's um, so many different plants of different heights and sizes growing at this edge, unless obviously someone has come and chopped it down, which, uh, but it's a natural edge. It will have so many different places that are some full sun, some half sun, some get morning sun, some get evening sun. So you've got this real niche, this, this mixed edge of availability of sunlight. But more importantly, as you said, you've got the nutrients that are coming from the forest. This forest that has been generating through all of its leaves. And is it just the leaf mold, that, that, or the leaf that falls down that's creating the nutrients? What else is creating the nutrients in the forest? Something like comfrey. Do you have comfrey? Uh, yeah, symphyton comfrey. Um, yes and no, but there's 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 various parts. You're not likely to find that in the middle of the forest. You're likely to find that definitely at the edge for sure. But in the forest itself, you've got life. You've got animals. You've got insects. You've got different animals that are eating and pooping and eating and pooping. They're eating the leaves. They're eating each other. They're eating and they're pooping. They're eating. And they're pooping. And they're munching and churning and crushing and manipulating and doing all this beautiful. They're creating life. Life begets life. Birds. And there's birds coming and eating and pooping. There's and they're bringing all of these things bring nutrients. And um, and so this forest, because it's full of life, has created and generated lots of nutrients and. The leaves and the twigs are a big significant part of it, whatever fruits the trees may be producing, but just the habitat that it's creating is creating this life. So, especially if you have a forest at the top of a hill and then um, your forest garden or this forest edge further down the hill, and it doesn't have to be so steep, then the nutrients themselves are going to be moving downhill. And then at this edge, this is where all of these plants can now get access to those nutrients and with the additional sunlight now all of a sudden they can thrive but where do they get their water from where do they get the water from go on the sky okay partly from rain um but as we know sometimes it doesn't rain so often it could be a month or two without rain sometimes so ah. where Taproot. Tap roots of plants? Um, trees. trees. Yeah, the trees. So trees yeah. have this magic, uh, well, not magic, they just do this most magical thing of finding water and finding underground sources of water. But not just that. Once you have many trees, i.e. a forest, they will be pulling water up and they will raise your water table and you know each tree has the ability to pump something like 20 liters of water per second through its system and uh, in some trees it's even much more uh, just look up how much does an oak tree pump uh, per day you'll be shocked 
a huge amount of water. So where's that water coming from? It's because uh, all the underground reservoirs, because of the, 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 the roots that plants, of the trees in particular put down, they're using capillary action to pull it up. They're using it through their system. They're bringing it through their roots, through the trunk, into the branches, using it uh, in whatever leaves and fruits and things. And then any excess water either gets released through the leaves we see it or it's transpiration they kind of sweat if you like they release it through their leaves uh, they can also release it back through the roots as well and through exudates and this is how they exchange nutrients and things so they're constantly pumping water up through and around your whole hill through your whole forest but they're constantly releasing it back into the atmosphere part of which can go up into the, be evaporated and become clouds, part of which can fall back to the ground and be reabsorbed. So part of that can then be absorbed by other plants and, and so on and so forth. So they basically create this beautiful cycle of moisture. So what a forest garden is, is it's uh, understanding this water cycle, understanding this nutrient cycle, and understanding this edge and putting that all together and orchestrating that in much the same way that a forest would do this naturally. But instead, we say, well, you know what? Instead of that wild plum, it would be nice if we had a nice, big, juicy Swedish plum. Instead of that crab apple, wouldn't it be nice if we had a really nice, I don't know, uh, Cox's Pippin? Uh, and so instead of just small wild fruits, we can stretch that just a little bit and say, yeah, let's get some more interesting fruits in here. What you find is many of the herbs and many of the yeah, things like that um, don't need much more nutrients at all. They're very, very, very much adapted, whereas um, the fruits will need a little bit more tweaking. So what you need to do is think, well, how can I create some more extra nutrients? And we're looking at really potassium and nitrogen. And someone mentioned earlier on comfrey, symphytum. That's a really amazing plant, which uh, has a beautiful deep tap root that pulls up uh, um, phosphates, um, uh, potassium, sorry, not phosphates. They pull up... Um, uh, potassium, it accumulates potassium and it breaks down very, very, very quickly and releases it to other plants. Then you have certain other plants which will fix nitrogen, which not just accumulate nitrogen, but actually encourage bacteria uh, to live with it in a symbiotic relationship that can then take uh, the, the nitrogen that's in the atmospheric nitrogen, uh, which no plant can absorb, but they can, the bacteria can break it down and feed it to the tree itself. But typically they are so efficient at doing that, they have an excess. So then they release it and allow other plants to then get access to it. So once we start understanding these patterns, we can now start to work with this to actually create a really rich, vibrant uh, ecosystem where we can stretch it beyond what you would just find at a normal forest edge so that we've got lots more yield that is much more interesting for us. And so now we can start bringing in things like, uh, you know, start thinking about all the other things apart from food, you know, how about the medicines? How about soaps? How about dye plants? Um, do we want to make some kind of a salt substitute? Do we want to make um, hair care? You know, um, whatever it is we want, Remember, at some point in human history, we met these needs by understanding how plants could do this for us. And so there is built inside of us, there is this knowledge of how to use those plants. It's in our DNA. We just need to kind of remember it of how to use those plants to actually meet many of our needs. And lucky for us, there are also lots of books <laughs> that, are, that are also compiling these things for those of us who aren't so deeply connected to our ancestral uh, DNA knowledge. Uh, so we can look at books to, to pick up this information. And there's lots of people who are um, sharing this information. So for example, we do 
anyone who studies with me, with me joins this Roots and Permaculture Network, and we have regular skill shares amongst ourselves, amongst the students. But we also do another project, which is for the public. It's called Roots and Resilience. I can share a link maybe later. But it's a, um, a public skill share where we can just share this kind of knowledge, plant knowledge, ferment, how to ferment things, how to whatever. So there's lots of people who are happy to, to share that kind of information. And so we can now start to really get creative in creating uh, uh, food forests, forest gardens. Oops, my screen just died then for a second. Um, yeah, we can start getting really creative in creating these forest gardens to really meet many of our needs. So that's generally what a forest garden is. And it could be anything from, you know, a typical small urban back garden to, you know, in, so here in London, I designed one for my parents here in Ilford, uh, which is, I think, 77 square metres, which I designed 11 years ago. And I think in the first two, three years when I started recording the yield, uh, or, well, my mum did it, it wasn't me because she lived here. And uh, I think she recorded something like 160 different yields she got from this tiny back garden. For the last six, seven years, the, the whole plot has been empty because both my parents passed away and I carried on doing my thing, traveling and teaching abroad. And it was only because of COVID that I came back. And uh, I came back, no one had touched this garden. I mean, once or twice, we maybe tried to remove some of the bramble um, with a few friends. But uh, as soon as I came back, I was managed, I'd managed to eat something like 80% of all my food all of my year long food has come from this garden um, because it was well designed. And to be honest, it was my first design. So it wasn't the best design. And I could definitely design much better than, than this implementation, but still it's insanely productive. It's incredibly productive. So it could be small. In Croatia, we, I had 25 hectares of land that I could play with. So we designed big scale forest gardens there. Um, so it could be any size you like. Um, the key thing is, well, there's a few different ways you can do it. You could either design it to be very, very, very low maintenance, almost zero maintenance, uh, or you could design it to be much higher yielding, but very high maintenance. Um, me personally, I, Someone once described me as the most productive, lazy hippie they've ever met because I spend so much time, put so much time and energy in designing how to be lazy and putting a lot of work and effort in how to then just make systems work on their own without me having to put the work and effort into it. And this garden here is a real testament to that. Yes, it's ugly. You know, anyone who comes to see it will say, my God, that's a mess. But then when I show them around and say, oh, yeah, you've got a fever? Yeah, take a bit of this. Oh, you've got a headache? Yeah, take a bit of that. Ah, oh, do you want something really tasty? Oh, try this. Oh, and, you know, um, it's incredibly productive. But from the eye of someone who is used to kind of a Kew, uh, not Kew Garden, Hampton Court kind of gardens with nice square bushes and things, this place is a mess. But from the perspective of nature, this place is beautiful. It's full of life, full of life. So these are forest gardens. What about community forest gardens? Because that was the subject we wanted to look at today. Um, what challenges do you feel there might be in creating a community forest garden? What are some of the major challenges? And there's quite a few. <laughs> Getting access to land or space to put it. Access to land, yep. The community itself, people will have different ideas about what they want. Uh -huh. Okay, so the kind of cohesion part of, yeah, of getting it together, for sure. Who owns the land? If the council owns it or something, you or it's too close to a building, you may not be allowed to plant uh -huh. a certain height of trees. Regulations, yeah, good one. I think Anita has her hand up as well. Um, 
the one issue that we're struggling with in the community forest garden that we're thinking about that keeps coming back is um, dog poo. Okay. Um, <laughs> so how to, yeah, how to manage. How to manage dogs and dog mm. walkers and their needs and their okay. Okay. excretions. So we did have a little bit of think of this in our uh, current forest garden design. So maybe we can look at that. Anything else? I think the, the, big, the big ones really are knowledge of how to make a forest garden. I see a lot of people create, putting a few trees and a few things underneath it and saying, this is a forest garden um, without really truly understanding it. And uh, something like 10, 11 years ago, when I, when I was last properly here in England, um, I went to look at a lot of the old forest gardens that were created and uh, more or less every single one of them was not working. So they're mostly in London. So there was one in, I think the oldest one was in Nolmead, which is near Kingston. And uh, then the other one was in uh, Brockwell Park in near Brixton. And all of them, they'd been planted so closely together and without really thinking about the nutrient cycles, without thinking about, well, first of all, that they were planted too close together so that after 10, 15 years, the canopies just start touching each other. There's no light coming through to the canopy floor anymore. And therefore the amount of fruit that they were getting was really down to a bare, bare, bare minimum. And, um, and they hadn't thought through the nutrient cycle. So where are your nutrients coming from? They hadn't done their calculations of where they're getting their nitrogen from, you know, what's fixing the nitrogen. They hadn't done any calculations on where their um, yeah, um, potassium, uh, how to get a potassium cycle going and so on and so forth. So just planting some trees and planting a few other things underneath it to make a kind of, you know, because that's what it looks like on YouTube. That's how other people have done it. That's not a forest garden. It may work for a few years, for a certain amount of time, but long term, a forest garden is something that will last for hundreds of years in a particular state because it's been well designed with minimal um, effort required on the part of humans to, to other than harvesting. When I remember, a, 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 I met some guy, he was a university professor and, um, and we were just talking and I was saying, oh my God, I don't know what to do with the apples this year. I've got so many apples, it's crazy. He goes, what are you talking about? There's no apples in England at all this year. This was maybe eight years ago or something. He said, uh, no, there's no apples anywhere in England. I said, oh my God, it's full of them. He said, that's impossible. He said, there was such, you know, as soon as the blossom came, there was such a strong frost or wind or something. I can't remember what he said. Uh, he said that the whole of the country, all of the apples are wiped out. There's no apples in the country. There's a shortage. I said, come and have a look then. You don't believe me. Came and had a look at the garden and sure enough, boom, full of apples. And my mum was still alive and this is just so magical. It was almost like I gave my mum a script to say, mum, if anyone ever comes over, say this. And I went out to go and get some lemon verbena to make like a drink. And as I was coming back in, I heard him ask my mum, so how much do you work in your garden? Oh, I don't really work in my garden. I said, well, well, who does the work? Well, no one really. And, well, okay, how much time do you spend at like weeding? Oh, no, no, we don't really weed. You know, a few things come and when Rakish comes over, you know, once or twice a month or something or every two, three months, he'll say, oh, look, yeah, you can eat this or you can do that with that. So we just leave them alone. We don't bother digging up the weeds because we let Rakish look at them. Um, he said, so you must be planting things. Oh, no, not really. We don't really plant anything. We just... Um, you know, Rakish comes over, sometimes puts his hands in his pockets, pulls out a few seeds, throws them around and, and then leaves. Um, that's about it, really. Uh, we don't plant stuff. He said, you must be making compost. So, yeah, 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 we've got this system. We just put stuff into it, but then we don't 
move it you don't turn it you don't water it you don't do anything with it you just put it in there and that's it so we don't really work we just put stuff in so you must be watering um no not really we've got these water butts you know and they're kind of full but to be honest we just use them to wash our hands with and um and this is the, the part that really got me he said so so what do you do he said oh every day we just go out there and we just harvest we just pick things and we just eat i say it was ah oh, mum beautiful i love her bless her soul it was almost like i gave her a script to say this she understood she understood that, that you know um I remember she gave me, she got me on this path. I have to 100% admit, uh, be very, very grateful for. When I was four years old, she gave me a cucumber seed when I was four years old to plant. And I watched this thing grow. And oh my God, it's growing. And I, and look, and, oh my God, this is a what? Cucumbers, wow, mom. And, and I'm still fascinated. I still have that same childlike fascination for plants even today, for anything, not just plants, for people, for animals, for, thank you, mum beautiful love you love you love you love you and um and just this imagination for seeing working out how why 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 it's still there and um and so yeah so she i remember very very clearly once um yeah she, we then got really busy as a family you know we were quite a poor family so we really had to work hard and we went through this period where none of us hardly ever had time to go into the garden and then we started to try and grow things again when things got, got a little bit easier. And she said, it's totally changed. She said, my God, there's so much slugs here. You know, we, 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 whatever you plant, it just gets decimated by slugs now. And she actually, I didn't even have to say anything to her. She said, and you know what the difference is, is back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, we had so many birds. So many birds here. But now everyone's chopped down their trees, all the front gardens, their car parks, they're, 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 everyone's chopped down their trees. There's just not so many birds here anymore. And now there's so many slugs. She worked this out. She was very sharp. So a forest garden is all about this balance. And, um, and to get back on track, sorry, I digress there. Um, I, I'm very easily taken off track in case you didn't notice. I get very excited about telling stories. Um, so, yeah, the bigger, some of the biggest challenges of creating community forest gardens are access to land, as you say, then the knowledge of how to actually really make a real forest garden, as opposed to just planting a few trees, putting a few things underneath it and calling it a forest garden, uh, which I see happen a lot. There are some really great books and really great courses out there for teaching you how to really make it. I'm not sure why so many people make it in such a, a strange way. And in fact, I've seen some teachers teach it in a strange way. So, okay, maybe. But for me, it's all about creating this harmony of animals and insects and, you know, really understanding and creating this ecosystem that then allows each plant. Because remember, every single plant wants to grow. It's, it's innate nature, it's survival. It's, I want to survive and in order for me to survive, I need to create a fruit or a seed or something in order for my genes to be preserved. So plants want to grow. All you need to do is understand them and understand what kind of environment do they like? What kind of environment will they really thrive in? Then help to co-create that environment. And then the plants will thrive. So it's a little bit about getting into the psychology of plants. So getting back to the some of the challenges, yeah. There's all the um, yeah the access to the land. There's all the restrictions, you know, uh, that you might have. Um, there's yeah, there's there's many things. So which one should we look at? Maybe access to land. Maybe have a look at that first. So. As we know, a lot of uh, parks, a lot of uh, councils are uh, struggling to find enough money to do all of the work that they need to do in each park. So there's constant cutbacks. So the, each council also is um, 
is under pressure to deliver certain targets, certain green initiative targets, which many of the councils have no idea how to do. If you read those documents, sorry, my screen's died again. If you read those documents uh, and understand what the council is, is obliged to try and deliver, very often a forest garden will deliver many, many, many of them. Biodiversity, uh, inclusion, you know, of, of you know, engaging uh, the community. Um, I mean, so many of the boxes are ticked in a forest garden. It's really, so that's one angle. Um, how to, yeah, and another area, another way that you can maybe find access is via a lot of the friends of different parks. Because uh, quite often they, it's, you know, and you really need to befriend them and be on the good side of them and, you know, uh, and they can then maybe give you access to different plots. Okay, so in terms of getting the knowledge of how to do it, there are many, many courses. So last year we did, I had 77 people come to two introduction courses, of which something like 40 of them came to part two, which was, so the first part was just introduction, this is what a forest garden is. Something like can't remember exactly the numbers, maybe 30, 33. I think 33 for some reason rings a bell. 33 of them came to the second part, which was right now we are going to, in this class, design a our forest gardens. So there must, I think there were something like um, 11 community forest gardens plus four or five personal forest gardens that we all helped each other to design during that course, and many of which are being implemented right now. So it's, it's happening. So there's many good teachers out there. There's many good websites with, um, right, by the way, I'm, I'm totally dyslexic. So when it comes to books and reading and finding information online, I'm not really the right person to ask about stuff like that because I don't read. I, I learn things by doing it and trying it myself. But I know there's tons and tons and tons of really good information out there on how to make a good forest garden. Martin Crawford is probably one of the most amazing people when it comes to documenting and sharing skills on how to create forest gardens uh, here in the UK, especially, uh, but which then goes for most of the temperate climates. So getting skilled up. And so the way that I typically try to do it if I want to get a community forest garden off the ground, I will find, if I can, three, four, five, six people who are really passionate to do it in your particular area. And I will walk them through this design process. So I'll get them on a training course. I'll get them through this training. So they are skilled up on what is a forest garden? How does it, how do you design it? And then get them to start connecting with the rest of their community because if it's just held in the hands of those few it's not our forest garden it's just this little clique's forest garden so the next stage is to show them how to engage the community how to get their ideas their interests obviously other people may or may not know how to design a forest garden invariably they probably won't know how to. So this kind of core team, you need to set it up in such a way that uh, other people will say, well, wouldn't it be nice if we had a plum tree? I would really love to see some sweet Sicily growing here. Wouldn't it be nice if we had an area that was just full of wildflowers? So they can give ideas, but it's then up to the design group to actually design it and then go back. So. What we've decided is, yeah, the sweet Sicily and that, that and that can go around this tree here. So you've got those here. The meadow with the, the wildflower can go over there because that connects with this and that then brings those nutrients from there into here and brings wildlife from that area into this area, which then comes and feeds the rest of the place. And so you, 
the group can justify it to everyone else, else as to why this is a really smart and say, oh, wow, thank you so much for that idea of the Sweet Sicily. I really love that. It's, wow. And now I've tried it for the first time. It's amazing. How come I never knew this plant before? Wow. Thank you so much for so how to work with people to encourage them, to engage them, to um, yeah, make them feel part of it. The next part is the implementation. And again, how do you ensure that as many people in the project are engaged in the implementation phase? So again, still the core group, uh, maybe within that group are also the organizers, the people who can really coordinate things. And uh, so it's still, you know, so you can, to a certain extent, invite others to come in and help coordinate. But the key thing is that you keep that to a nice, a nice group of maybe no more than 10 people so that whatever meetings you need to have, whatever design processes you go through are manageable. Me personally, because I'm really into sociocracy, collaborative decision making, I try as much as possible, whatever project I'm running, to work with sociocracy. So we make a common vision. What is it that we would like to do in this project? And then every decision we make thereafter is based against not do I like this person who's making the proposal, not do I, you know, do I have a, you know, yeah, the last, you know, nothing about personal feelings or anything, but does this proposal help us to achieve that vision or not? Does it help us to get to where we want to go to or not? Simple as that. So now we can make really good decisions collaboratively together to help us achieve what we collectively um, identified that we want to do. So there's lots and lots and lots and lots of tricks. By the way, tomorrow, if anyone's interested, I'm doing a, a talk on sociocracy at one o'clock as part of this uh, transition um, open space. So if people want to know more about that, we can talk about that tomorrow. Um, so some of the other challenges and then Maybe I'll pick one more and then I'll open it up to questions and answers. So start thinking if there's something that uh, would be useful. So uh, getting access to space. Um, ah, dog poo, I think was one of the. Um, so what we did when we were looking at our space is we looked at what we call desire lines. We looked at human flows and human flows. Typically, the dogs walk with the humans. Um, so we're looking at, at our space and how is it people navigate through here? And in this particular case, uh, very few people cut across it. Because of the shape of it, very few people cut across it. But on the original place that we were going to give, uh, we were being given, it was very much right in the heart of where dog walkers would have gone. So when we started thinking about the first place, we started talking to the dog owners and explaining what the project was and just under, starting to understand their patterns and what they needed and blah, 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 uh, just to get familiarity just so they get to know what we're doing and what we designed or what we kind of preempted in a space that eventually we didn't get but, uh, but what we designed is if you imagine uh, the walkers would kind of go around um, is we took one particular place and we kind of cornered it off so that actually your, your pathway, instead of going this way, just went this way and like this, and you could carry on going. So it wasn't a big detour for the dog walkers. But the space itself, there was only one entrance. So, anyone going into that place is not going to use it as a shortcut to cut through. The only people who are going there are people who want to go there. So maybe the dog walkers may choose to walk their dogs around it, but perhaps, but if they're just walking their dogs, maybe it's, they just want, they'll probably just skirt around it. And those who do walk into it, you know, maybe we would have signs up saying, hey, this is an edible garden. 
and there's many things growing on the floor that are for people to eat. So can you please be mindful of that? So in the first instance, you reroute people so that they don't feel like they need to cut across it. So we actually chose the piece of land based on how can we, knowing where people do walk, how can we divert it in such a way that it, their, their path is not so massively detoured, um, but they can, yeah, so they can still walk their dogs, but without too much of an inconvenience. But for sure, they're not allowed into our plot. Now, we've looked at the plot that we have been given here at my local um, one in Ilford. And now we're going to look at the, the pathways of how people get in and how they get out. And again, uh, if we look at where people start from, you know, where the entrance points are um, and where people are likely to want to go. And we know almost no one cuts across this. If we were to put a pathway from the place where most people enter and then where they go to and make a cut across, lots of people will cut through there. So now we need to make a decision. Do we want to encourage that or do we want people to go out of their way to then come in and circumnavigate it and then leave? In which case it's really not a shortcut. So again, the only people who come there are people who really want to use the space and make use of the space. But then we'll have lots of things on the edges that people can interact with stuff on the edge. So they can interact with the forest garden without even having to come into the middle of it. And so some of the things that we're putting in the middle of the forest garden are things like a, a lack of meeting space. So just logs or um, yeah, tr tree stumps, which I, I do have a particular trick of where I, I kind of, um, make a circle and then around that a bigger circle which I then fill in with soil and mound up to the log so you have this kind of uh, garden raised garden around the logs um, so it becomes a functional edible space as well as a meeting space and we drill holes in the, the logs so that it becomes an insect habitat and blah 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 so we have several functions all stacked into one but it can become a meeting space. We have different tables with chess boards etched into it. So people can come and just sit all day long, just playing chess uh, or draughts or whatever. Um, we've got different places where couples can just come and sit, we have places where individuals can sit. We've got, you know, yeah. So we've got several different places of interest where people can just come into the forest garden to, yeah, to interact with it as opposed to just passing through it. So, okay, I think that's enough of me talking endlessly. What kind of questions do you have? First of all, is there anyone who is looking to make a forest garden, uh, a community forest garden, who's got a really burning kind of question because it's really pertinent to them? Maybe let's, if we can give them priority first and then open it up to more generic questions after that. Is there anyone who's got a community forest garden they're looking to make? Anita. Hi, yeah, um, there's a bunch of us at Transition Town Wellington down in Somerset. Um, and we are working with a local community interest company uh, to, uh, we're right at the beginning of trying to plan what could be a forest garden for the whole community. Um, and one of the things is that there are two watercourses that go through the land. Um, part of the land is very, very boggy and wet um, and is already quite a nice wild kind of wetland. Mm -hmm. And my burning question at the moment is actually about phosphates. And I don't know if that's something that you know about or if people here know about, but whether that's... Um, what, what, what kind of um, planting might be good for phosphate mitigation? Is it, is it even a thing that we need to be thinking about? Because it seems to be very high up on the council's agenda. So I don't know in terms of, um, yeah, the accumulation of phosphates. Uh, so plants will absorb phosphates and especially fungi will absorb it really well. So one of the best ways of, if you've got any kind of uh, excess of any uh, chemical, toxin, nutrient, whatever, 
uh, fungi is a really amazing way of uh, absorbing because what fungi does, and we're talking about not the mushroom itself, but we're talking about the hyphae, the actual network, is it has the ability to absorb almost anything. And it then exchanges it with other plants. So it does like, um, you know, using chemical exchanges, it kind of, uh, or if you want to think of it a bit more dramatically, it's a little bit like, um, what was it, Del Boy? You know, he's kind of, yeah, buy something and try and sell it off. Yeah, anyone want a bit of this? Yeah, yeah. a bit of a plutonium, anyone? Oh, I've got some arsenic spare. Um, anyone? Uh, oh, nitrogen. Yeah, there's always someone who wants some nitrogen and phosphates. And, and basically, if no one wants it, it will just store it. It will hold on to it, so it will sequester it. It will lock it in. So this is uh, what they're noticing in places like Fukushima and, think, and places is they're really surprised at the level, you know, they've seen how the forests have taken over and how the fungi has started to, um, you know, create its networks and how it's really, uh, really affecting the, the radiation levels that they would expect. It's not, you know, so it's, it's, they're doing their work. And, you know, you see there's a lot of uh, like for oil spills or for, for many things. So if you've got an excess of anything, creating this fungal network, which if you look at a forest floor, that's exactly what, what's going on. Uh, so a forest garden as opposed to an orchard is a really positive way of sequestering whatever excess, whether it's phosphates, but plants need phosphates. So, um, and so, so to a certain amount, they will be absorbing it and making use of it. And then the rest, as I say, the, 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 the actual, um, yeah, the fungi can lock in. So now what you need to be thinking, what, when you first started talking, the, the, you've got uh, some very, very boggy areas. So how to turn that into maybe some kind of ponds or lakes or aquatic, you know, and have, there are so many plants that are edible that you can grow in water. When we do the permaculture course, I try and explain to people about the cycles of nutrients and, you know, and if you look at it, the, you know, gravity and is always going to pull nutrients down to the lowest point. So when it rains, nutrients fall down the hill. And so they always collect at the bottom of the hill of any valley or hill. And what you typically find there, you find lakes, you find ponds, you find, you find water courses, because that's also where water collects. So very often in uh, a landscape, the pond is actually one of the richest, nutritionally the richest parts of your landscape. And there are so many plants that, remember plants came from the sea, they came from water in the first place. And so there are many, 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 many plants that we can grow in water. And, and yet so few people actually do that. And yet it is, as I say, the richest part of your landscape. And especially if it has an excess of nutrients in it, planting things in there is, again, another way of balancing those nutrients. Take the nutrients up into the plants. So first thing would be to those boggy areas. How do you make that into an edible pond? And again, we've got, I've got lots of ideas of lots of different plants that you can plant in there to make a beautiful edible pond. Um, then the other areas, so, so maybe you can be uh, drawing a lot of the, yeah, making sure that, you know, that, that part is, is managed. So then, then the rest of it, that's where you put all of your other more conventional uh, forest garden type plants knowing that it's locked up in there and that's what creates a lot of the forest floor edge or the forest floor rather with all the fungi which can then again balance the system i see one more person has a hand up jennifer from stafford hello staffordshire yeah um so i'm a community ambassador for um uh, zero carbon rouge league which is where i'm actually living and we're trying to put together a um well basically they've got the they've got funding for a community orchard but i'm very much thinking especially listening to this even more so that i think a forest garden would make much more sense now we've got two i've got two potential sites in my mind one is potentially um council 
and it's basically parkland what we've got in our in where we are but of course then that's probably been very heavily fertilized and very chemically treated over the years and then the other potential site which is the private site owned by one of the companies that are part of this um zero carbon trust is on the edge of a brownfield site well in fact actually it's on the edge of an active um well closed down coal um coal towers and that's very much on the uh, on the river banks as well but the part of land, this land's been very weirdly used they actually had a private golf course for the staff that works at the coal power station so i'm just there's obviously a few different things see that site i think is more viable from the of getting it accessed but there's a lot of questions for me there about obviously we've got to do a lot to change that land i mean there's obviously going to be sand there's going to be the phosphates it's going to be uh, chemical runoff and all that kind of stuff that has a lot more queries for me so I, I just need to uh, I'm just trying to get my head around that really and setting up the group and everything there's a lot of good questions and some great stuff said already but any ideas or advice from yourself Rakesh or anybody really on suggestions on how I can help middle manage this kind of thing really just as a volunteer. So first of all yeah you really need to understand what kind of toxins uh, what kind of chemicals are in the soil so to do a if, if you know it is a site that has been used for some kind of, you know, coal mining or, or whatever, you know, some, some kind of industrial process. You really need to know what's in it. I mean, to a certain extent, the fungi will lock things up. Uh, but in the mean, so long term, you can be doing the, 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 you know, the, the, the remediation, the actual cleansing of the soil long term. But in the short term, if you're growing certain things that um, people then eat, you, you want to be very careful. Uh, you know, typically, when, when you make a forest garden, you'll be designing for what it's going to look like in 25, 30 years time when it hits maturity, when it hits the, 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 the climax size. Uh, but you design it in such a way, what do I get from my forest garden year one? What do I get year two? Because I want to eat this year. And so you, you have short term things planted uh, immediately while the forest actually matures. Now, if that soil, ha you know, if there's still toxicity in that soil beforehand, you really want to be very, very careful. And you want to make sure that maybe those first you don't do this, this phase of where you're getting things for the first four or five years because you want the, the remediation part to work. You want this forest floor. Uh, to be established uh, you want the fungi in there you want certain amount of trees and you know to be continuing this uh, the, the, the remediation process and so on and so forth so I'd be careful so the other side is also do you how accessible is that private land to the public if that is who you actually want yeah we've got public access we've got public yeah. access anyway the whole the whole site is currently being collapsed down um, mm -hmm. and the site, is, the site is completely being converted it's been decimated it's being converted and there's lots of things planning to be put on that site anyway so there's a strip of land that runs along the river embankment so i know there's already support from the river trust and stuff about cleaning up the rivers and stuff so it tying quite nicely but the toxin thing's a big question for me but i think we have got some land surveys that might give some answers for that to see whether the yeah. it is a viable site and like you say have we can get a quick turnaround because that's <laughs> And if people want to see it work and straight away, um, it's something we've got to consider because if the toxicity is an issue, then obviously we might have to do something temporary elsewhere to try and continue building the engagement, really. So what I've done in, in one particular place, one design, is uh, where we had this issue, is we said, all right, let's uh, start growing some things in raised beds all the way around it. So we made a border and we made um, like a... Uh, we made a non-edible hedge, which is also a windbreak. And the main purpose of, of planting those things is to do the remediation work and to create an ecosystem, to create the, uh, like a little microclimate. And so in the first five years, growing in the beds. So the soil, it doesn't touch the soil underneath. It's, it's enclosed, it's separated until we got a kind of safe reading from the generic soil because of all the wood chip and all the, the material that we'd put down. So after about five years, we kind of got safe readings. 
and then we can start putting in the other plants. Um, so, yeah, so the, the real first thing is, is really understanding the soil quality and whatever toxins. So I see uh, Lynn has also got her hand up, so maybe we can answer that. How, how are we doing in terms of time? Um, we're technically supposed to end now, but I don't mind another 15, 20 minutes if, uh, if you're cool with that. I'll, I'll be very quick because you partly okay. answered it, Rakesh. Yeah. I was just going to say to Jennifer, um, our parish council, uh, not the not the borough council, but the parish council has planted sort of three local community orchards um, in the past year. But they're very small; they're like six trees in a small patch, um, and there's nothing around them. I mean, one's on a football field, very windswept, and I don't know whether they'll last. But again, I would say your biggest problem is the toxicity of the soil, especially if you're planning to. Yeah, well, it's, because it's a community orchard, you're planning to grow edible fruit trees, aren't you? Um, and the second thing is with the choice of the sites, if it's going to be a community forest, you've got to have a community around it to get up the interest, you know, and the people to work with you. Um, so with the Brownfield site, the second one you were talking about, are, are there actually houses around there now? Is there an existing community, I would say? Because um, really, right now, when you can't actually do much, <clears throat> and that's another issue, you, you know, you can't do group work, even outside. <coughs> You're limited to sort of single figure numbers. Um, you could really need to sort of uh, work on pulling the community together, uh, sort of pre-design okay. stage, as it were. <laughs> Can I suggest? Um, I, I don't. Have, have people been using Wonder Me on uh, as part of this transition? Because I know I set up the Wonder Me for this transition network, uh, and I know at first they were not. They were a little bit skeptical, but then Mikey and and the team were like, "Wow, this is amazing! We could have done the whole thing." Have people been using Wonder Me yet? Because I, I, I'm, to be honest, even though I did help coordinate some parts of this this event I, I I've been so busy these last three weeks I haven't even attended one session so I'm not quite sure where where this where it's at but it's a really great platform where you can meet each other and start having these kind of conversations and um, you can meet in little groups of 15 you can kind of so so perhaps these kind of maybe what we can do is create when they're doing the next public uh, Wonder Me event is we can set up a little forest garden area and then people can just chat away, meet each other because there's a lot of you here. There were 50 people here at one point. You can chat away to each other and just meet each other, especially if you put your names and where you're from and stuff. And, and so you can have these really beautiful conversations to, to kind of, yeah, start supporting each other. So because you've registered, I've got your email. So next time it happened, I can email you all to say, hey, come along on this day. Or even if they're not going to do it, how about I organise one? I organise a little forest garden uh, chat at some point. In, to be honest, it will be next week because right to the, I think, till Sunday, I'm just chock a chock a chock a block. Uh, so maybe next week after the conference is over, we can organise a little forest garden chinwag. How's that sound? Um, okay, any one last question? Is there anything else, anything else burning for people? David from Southampton. Uh, I, uh, you said that you did a couple of courses last year. You mm -hmm. ran a couple of courses. Are you doing any courses this year? I am actually, good question. Almost like I planted you to scream. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> we have never met. You've not paid to <laughs> uh, um, actually, Discount voucher later, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I do have a forest garden course, and I should really have the date to my to hand, shouldn't I? But I don't. Uh, aren't I terrible? I'm just going to my Facebook page now. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. So the next forest garden course is in May. So I've got a two day, two half day sessions, meaning uh, three four hours each day on Saturday, Sunday, the 8th and 9th of May. 
and then it will be every Tuesday evening for I think eight sessions and it's those eight sessions where you make your real design so the first two days the Saturday Sunday is just a generic introduction this is what a forest garden is this is how to design one so that gives you what you need to know to maybe make one yourself in the future. Um, and then the other eight sessions, the evening sessions once a week are the, the times when you, you say, right, here's my plot, here's my map, help. Right, how do I choose the plants? How do I know how to space the plants? How do I do my, so we walk through all the, the calculations of where to plant things, what plants work, go in which area, how do I calculate the amount of nutrients I need? What about all the really fun stuff? You know, how do I embed like a children's play area into this? How do I create this as a place that's really fascinating for old people to just hang around and chill out and meet each other? How do I make this space, you know, attractive to da, 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 da. We talk about all that kind of stuff. And we can also touch a little bit on governance as well on how to make good decisions, collaborative decision-making. If that's interesting for many projects, that is the single thing that probably kills most projects is people arguing amongst each other, people coming in with ego, people coming in with vested interests. And so that's why I'm really strong on sociocracy, on collaborative decision-making. And um, yeah, so, if you're going to make a community forest garden, I would probably advise you to think about the governance. I'm not saying you have to choose sociocracy, but really seriously think about the governance and the whole structure of how how people work well together, because that is the single thing that could, the most common thing that destroys projects. Um, one other just conceptual thing, many people talked about orchards. Um, what is the difference from what you've heard now between an orchard compared to a forest garden? And what's the advantage of a forest garden over an orchard and vice versa? Where, where would you choose an orchard? Where would you choose a forest garden? What's the pros and cons of the two? You sound like you're working with the edge of a forest. Mm -hmm. and, and, and an orchard is it's all apple trees. I mean, it's a different thing. Yeah, so an orchard is pretty much tree, gap, tree, gap, tree, gap. Now, what's the problem with that? Or what do you, as the person who is going to have to manage that, what is it that you're going to do, have to do to really keep that and allow that to be really fruitful? You, you're presumably going to have to sort of get some nutrition there because the, the idea of like, from what I want to what you said, and like if you're working on the edge of a forest, is you've got this sort of like resource, mm -hmm. which is kind of like all of that the, the the water cycle that's going on. There's the nutrient cycle that's going on. There's all the the pooping that's going on, <laughs> and then yeah. you're kind of like feeding off of that by setting up something where you don't have to where you can just sit in a deck chair. Exactly, it's it's totally lacking Genius. all these <laughs> all these natural cycles for continuously year after year enriching the environment how creating all these um cycles and if we look at it there's one species of plant on this planet that is one of the most if you could call a plant greedy i know it's maybe a little bit uh what human centric i'm not quite sure what the correct term is to to, to try and put human values onto plants but there's one plant that absorbs more nutrients than any other family of plants. And that's the grasses. And the grasses get their nutrients from the top 20 to 30, 20 centimeters typically, unless you've got elephant grass here in the tropics or somewhere, in which case it's much deeper. But here in the temperate climate, in the UK in particular, most grasses get their nutrients from the top 20, 30 centimeters. Where do you think trees get the majority of their nutrients from? Way down. No, ah, the top 20, 30 centimeters. Mm. So imagine yourself as a tree. Imagine, you know, typically people, when they draw trees, they draw a nice big canopy and then they draw something, a kind of similar shape of roots going downwards. 
artistic nonsense. It's almost no trees in the temperate climate behave like that. Where is the continuous resupply of nutrients deep, deep, deep in the soil? 10 meters down, five meters down, two meters down. Where's it gonna come from? It can't. That, that soil has been there for millions of years or since the last ice age, probably 10,000 years. Uh, so it's not got a new supply of nutrients. But where is the forest going to generate a continuous resupply year after year of new nutrients? On the surface. At the surface. So as a tree, as your survival strategy, why would you put your nutrients, why would you put your roots so deep down in a place where there is no continuous resupply of nutrients? You're not. You're not going to do that. You put it in the top 20 centimetres and you go as far out. What's the other advantage of having tree roots that are at the surface and really widely spread? First of all, it's stability. So when a, a strong wind comes, it's got stability, but also it's got more chances of finding nutrients from further away. If it spreads its roots in, you know, uh, eight times the size of its uh, canopy, eight times away in all directions, it's increased its ability, it, its chances of finding nutrients. So trees, their roots typically grow top 20, 30. They do have some laterals. Some of the laterals are looking for water. So the, the roots that grow downwards are looking for water. They can also get some nutrients, but the majority of the white roots that absorb nutrients are in the top 20, 30 centimeters. So if you grow grass in that top 20, 30 centimeters, how intelligent is that? What does that mean you're going to have to do? So you're planting something that, you know, if anyone wants to watch a really crazy, amazing documentary, there's a documentary from the BBC called How to Grow a Planet. How to Grow a Planet. Fantastic, really amazing. I show it to as many of my students as possible. It's mind-numbingly incredible. Uh, so much information. He shows how grasses almost suck oxygen in, as opposed to many plants which just passively absorb nutrients. They, they try and take up as much as they possibly can. So you're planting something that is, let's say, inherently really, really greedy, needs so much nutrients, that's now competing against your trees. So you're constantly having to work to constantly having to keep bringing in nutrients. For, first of all, because you don't have a nutrient cycle. And secondly, because you've planted something that's going to leach your system of nutrients. So again, it's about observation. It's about understanding the systems, understanding how nature works and working with her. Understanding her, working with her, allow her to do what she wants to do, but in a way that also gives you what you also would like. You know? But within reason, within the means of what the forest can do. So you really work with nature. I mean, and there's so many beautiful reasons as to why to do this. It really helps us to become humble, to really understand how to live within our means. It really allows us just to deeply connect to the absolute beauty and magnificence of nature. And, um, and nature is so resourceful, so abundant, so forgiving. She really is a lesson. She, you know, we don't need schools. We just need to go and study nature. We just need to study how she works and how she creates this richness and abundance. And that you'll get everything you need to know about life from there. So um, that would be my closing statement, I think. Um, yeah, so if anyone's interested, I can connect you up to the different, um, yeah. At least maybe I can connect you up to the Roots and Resilience sessions that we do. They're free public skill shares. Um, maybe the next one we can do something. They're typically on the 21st. So there should be one coming up. Uh, 
yeah, 21st. So there should be one coming up soon. Um, maybe we can do something on community forest garden fair. Um, I can share workshops that we're doing um, and whatever else. And yeah, let's try and organize a meetup next week sometime for forest gardens under, yeah, on Wonderly. We'll try and arrange that sometime. So beautiful. Thank you all very much for arriving um, and for your interest. I, my, my passion really is to try and uh, get as many community forest gardens going, as many forest gardens going as possible, but through a community forest garden, hopefully that will inspire people to convert their back gardens into something more like a, a forest garden and therefore just multiply this. So we have all this most beautiful, amazing habitat for animals and insects. And, you know, we, we ah, there's so many advantages of a forest garden. As I say, it ticks so many boxes of what we need to be doing as human beings who have spent so much time and energy destroying this planet because of our greed. Uh, we, can be the generation that turns that around. We can be the people if we just make these simple steps to really start making a difference. You know, future generations can look back at us and say, wow, in spite of all the hardships, in spite of all the problems and all the government pressures, you stood up and you did something about it. You made a forest garden and we're still reaping the results of it so i hope you join me in this revolution and um yeah see you out there somewhere okay lots of love everyone take care moments of appreciation for rakesh thank you so much thank you thank you beautiful have fun see you around somewhere yeah bye bye, bye.